Michael York, and uh, I'm with uh, Majestic America Life. Uh, I'm actually in the uh, corporate office in St. Louis right now, but I had the pleasure of moving out here uh, on the boat. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, living out here for a number of years, and I was uh, the hotel manager on this boat and the executive director. Uh, we started this tour, gosh, I guess uh, 10, 12 years ago, there was a lady, Ed, Marion Edgar, used to be an onboard sales representative that started this tour. And after she left, I picked up on it and uh, have been continuing the tradition. And, and my hotel managers are going to continue to the uh, tradition. And today you're going to learn a little history of steamboating. Uh, history of the Delta Queen uh, Steamboat Line, which then became the Majestic America Line, and some of the history of this boat, which is fairly recent. Uh, but the first steamboat came down in 1811, and it was started out in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they were very optimistic. They named that named that boat after their final destination. They called it the New Orleans. And uh, they left Pittsburgh in uh, October of 1811. When they got to Louisville, they stopped there. And although it was not an excursion boat, the captain had brought his wife along. And when they got to Louisville, they ended up staying there a month. And it wasn't because she was out doing excursions or shopping or anything. She was eight months pregnant when they left. So she had the baby. They gave her time to recover. And then they continued their, what became a very exciting trip onto New Orleans. As they were passing New Madrid, they had the worst earthquake that the eastern United States has ever had. They tell me the river flowed backwards at times. But in this little boat, they continued on down to New Orleans, and it was the first successful steamboat trip in the United States on the Ohio and Mississippi River. It truly opened up the Western rivers, as they were called at that time, to settlements, these small towns, St. Louis, all of these little towns along the river. You could not only go down the river, which you could before, you could go in your flat boat or your keel boat and take your goods down the river, but then you could go to New Orleans, sell your goods, and turn around and go back home again on the steamboats. When they would bring these flat boats and fuel boats with their goods down, they would float them down prior to the steamboat. And when you got to New Orleans, you would tear your boat apart. Hopefully you had had some good sails. You would buy a horse, if you had those good sails, and you could ride back home. And if you didn't have such good sails, you got to walk back home. And a lot of the homes that were built in the French Quarter during that period were built out of wood from the old flat boats and keel boats that had come down the river. So from that modest beginning in 1811 up until about 10 years prior to the Civil War, or as we Southerners call it, the War for the Depression. Uh, that was the heyday of the steamboats. And there were somewhere between 2,500 and I've heard 10,000 steamboats flying the rivers on these western rivers. It really was the concord of its day. Uh, because of the steamboat, it could not only carry goods down the river and you could carry people and started the settlement of the interior of the United States. So we owe a lot 
to the history of the steamboat. The worst steamboat disaster in maritime history happened right after the Civil War when a boat by the name of Sultana was being loaded with uh, northern uh, soldiers. Pittsburgh, Mississippi it was loaded. And unfortunately, there were some greedy persons involved. A boat that shouldn't have been carrying over a couple of hundred at the most was carrying 1,200 men, taking them back north. Outside of Memphis, the boiler blew up and lost nearly all of the lives on that boat, worse than the Titanic. And uh, you don't hear too much about that because the day that that happened, the front page news was that President Lincoln had been assassinated. So uh, the Sultana was, was not the front page news. I'm sure it would have been, and we would remember it a lot more, and hear a lot more about it in our history had not the terrible assassination had happening at the same time. After the Civil War, the trains, and especially in the northern states, had started to expand. And they could go to places that the riverboats couldn't go. And they didn't have to depend on the water level. They didn't need a 12-foot depth that the Corps of Engineers guarantees us. That is, if you take the government to guarantee these things. Uh, but we also don't know the exact count because we didn't have the Coast Guard regulating the boats in the early 1800s. So you didn't have to register your boat. You could build a boat and operate it. So you didn't have the government uh, bureaucracy that is very good about keeping records uh, to know the exact numbers that you had in those days. But after the Civil War, the uh, steamboat started declining, and another incident happened with the railroads. And uh, as they expanded, they started building bridges, and they would build bridges across the river. Well, as you can see, if you see these tall stacks that we have, uh, and are historically correct in that the old steamboats also had very tall stacks because they wanted to get the embers, although we're not burning wood or coal, but, uh, they wanted to get the embers far above the cotton or the wood or whatever product that they were carrying on their boat. Remember, these are all wooden boats in those days. So they couldn't go under the bridge. So that started stopping the riverboat travel. And uh, someone you may remember in history represented the railroads on the side of that court case, and this young attorney won the case on behalf of the railroads. His name was Abraham Lincoln. And uh, after Mr. Lincoln won that case, the steamboat men, being a genius and wanting to stay in business, developed the tilting stack. And I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see the stack tilt on this boat. Ours is on hydraulics. And uh, I believe we do it, I know we did it once coming out of Natchez as we were nearing the uh, power line that's just above Natchez. So uh, the steamboats uh, were able, by being able to lower their stacks, to be able to stay in business. But as I said, their business declined, the railroads expanded more into the south. And so they needed to develop another source of income. So they really did become the time forge of their day because they started carrying passengers who wanted to go and not be jostled all around. Uh, we're not necessarily in an anxious and mood to get where they were going. They could afford to spend 10 or 11 days going somewhere. So the great steamboats and some of the greatest steamboats that were ever built were built after the Civil War. The J.M. White, and if you recognize that name, you're having dinner at the J.M. White dining room. Uh, 
Um, when they built this boat, they did a lot of research. And I really have to give a lot of credit to the interior designers who did this boat. Uh, we had the Delta Queen at that time, which if you haven't been on it, it is just terrific little boat. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Delta Queen while we're on the tour. And they had built the Mississippi Queen in 1976. And they decided in 1992 that they were going to build an even grander version of all of their boats. Uh, at the time, it was going to be called Well of America. And eventually, that name was changed and it became the American Queen. The American Queen came out in 1995. By this time, the company had moved from Cincinnati, which had always been its headquarters, uh, to New Orleans. And the boat was christened by Angel Harvey. And Angel is the wife of radio commentator Paul Harvey. And since we were New Orleans home based at that time, it was christened with the world's largest bottle of Tabasco sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't always have to have champagne for these days. The Delta Queen, the Majestic America line, has been under a number of flags through the years. It started out in 1890, and a young captain by the name of Gordon Green met a nice young lady by the name of Mary Becker. They were married in Cincinnati. Captain Green, who was a riverboat captain, uh, bought another boat, and actually, by the time the Green Line Steamers, which was the name of this company, up until the 1970s, up until 1974, uh, operated under Green Line Steamers, and Captain Green uh, married Mary Becker, Mary Becker Green, we call her Grandma, and she became one of the first licensed female riverboat captains in the United States. Uh, as is pretty much today to become a riverboat captain, you usually are the son of a riverboat captain or the nephew of a riverboat captain. Uh, but there haven't lot, there's been a lot of females uh, riverboat captains. But Mary Green became one and became quite renowned as one. Unfortunately, Gordon passed away as a relatively young man. He was in his late 40s. And Mary Becker Green became president of Green Lines and continued the company on with her son, Tom. And she and Tom Green ran the company. Um, Tom married a young lady by the name of Linda. And unfortunately, uh, Tom must have had the same element as his father because Tom passed away in his late 40s. And then Mary Becker Green and her daughter-in-law, Letha Green, ran the company up until Mary Becker Green passed away on the Delta Queen in 1949. And some people say that she's never left. And some of those are pretty reliable sources that uh, say that Mary Green is still on the Delta Queen. I'll tell you a couple of stories that you promised not to tell us about. I do think it was on the uh, History Channel one time, so you may, you may have seen it. Uh, usually around the time of year in October when they're talking about the ghost stories uh, and they're talking about the haunted home, sometimes they'll play a story, and it's, it's been on for a number of years now, uh, about the haunted steamboat, and that is the Delta Queen. Uh, after Mary Green passed away, Mary was a teetotaler, and she did not allow alcohol on the Delta Queen. And after she passed away, and Letha was trying to find some additional revenue sources, uh, she allowed the Texas Lounge on the Delta Queen, which at that time had only been used as a gentleman smoking lounge, the ladies had to sit outside, that seemed uh, but she took the smoking lounge and uh, they made it into a bar. Within days, 
the Delta Queen was ran by a towboat. The name of that towboat was the Mary B. <laughs> We have a captain that worked up with us up until very recently, up until this past year, and he retired, Mike Williams. Uh, we had what we call our layup period, usually in December or January, where we take the boats in, we can put in our new carpet. If we need to do a dry dock, we'll do it during that period. But there's no crew on board, there's no passengers on board. We usually have one or two security people that will uh, live on board just to keep an eye on the boat, make sure that uh, no intruders come on board. And so Mike had taken it up on himself, and this is a captain, uh, to stay on board during layup. He was in his cabin, it was way after midnight, and he hears this commotion. And he goes, well, there's somebody's on this boat, and his cabin's up on the third deck of the Delta Queen. He starts his patrol and he goes all the way down to the engine room. A valve had been left open. The Delta Queen was flooding. Oh, wow. He closed the valve and saved the Delta Queen. So Mike swears to this day that Mary Becker awakened him so that he could go downstairs, close that valve, and save her boat. So uh, those are just a couple of the stories. Uh, Marcy Richardson, who worked for us for a number of years as uh, one of our historians, swears that uh, she has seen Mary Green walk through the uh, Betty Blake Lounge as uh, she was on the boat, uh, quietly reading in that area. So. Uh, I personally have not ever seen Mary Becker Green on the boat, but if she is there, she's a very kind and benevolent uh, friend and, and a good ghost. So uh, that's the story of Mary Becker. But women have very, been very influential uh, in the running of this company ever since uh, Gordon Green passed away uh, with, uh, with uh, Mary Becker and then Lisa Green ran the company up until 1974. She then went into partnership. She was uh, losing money. And uh, she sent out a letter to all of her passengers for the next season saying that, you know, I'm terribly sorry if you booked with me for next season. Uh, we're not going to be able to run the Delta Queen any longer. And we're returning your deposits. Well, there had been a gentleman and his family on the previous season. And he lived in California, and at dinner he was telling his kids that they were going to have to cancel their vacation the next summer on the Delta Queen. And as kids are known to nag every once in a while, they didn't have one or two. Uh, they, start, they had such a great time the previous year, they started nagging their dad said, why don't you do something, Dad? You can help this lady. That's such a wonderful boat. That was such a great vacation. And he goes, okay, okay. I'll, I'll send her a letter and see if we can do something. You know, he did. They ended up forming a new partnership. This gentleman was a very wealthy individual by the name of Symington. Uh, his claim to fame was he invented Muzak. So he was a man of means. He was a polite enthusiast. And so he became the operating partner with Lisa and uh, had the uh, Calliope put on the Delta Queen. Lisa never wanted to put a Calliope on the boat. She always felt that it would keep the passengers away. Uh, it really wasn't needed. Uh, they had Calliopes in those days. The Calliope has its own home history. But Lisa never had one on the steamboat. So, uh, the showboats had them, but not Lincoln's boat. So anyway, he was the managing partner. Obviously, he was into music. He was a steamboat enthusiast. So he insisted that they put a Calliope on the Delta Queen. They did, and they started playing the Calliope as they would go into port. They played the Calliope as they left the port. They played the Calliope as they went through the locks. People would come down to the locks to see the boats and listen to the Calliope. 
and it was really an ideal marketing plan. It revitalized the company, and they were able to keep the company, uh, and the company survived. Uh, so after Mr. Symington was with the company for a few years, it was taken over by overseas National Airways. Uh, they ran the company, uh, decided that airplanes and steamboats necessarily, necessarily fit together, sold the company to Coca-Cola of New York. Uh, they ran the company for a while. In fact, uh, during their administration was when, they did, when the Mississippi Queen uh, was planned and brought out in 1976. Well, finally, Coca-Cola uh, out of Atlanta, the main company, decided that you, know, you need to pay attention to Coke and don't worry about this little steamboat company to so get rid of it. So they did. A gentleman out of Chicago by the name of Sam Zell purchased the company. It became a publicly traded company. It did very well with the Delta Queen and the Mississippi Queen. They built the American Queen, as I mentioned, in 1995. Everything went very well up until 9-11. By that time, the company had not only had these three little boats that were very successful, uh, they had expanded into Hawaii and had two cruise ships that were running into Hawaii. Well, they were so successful in Hawaii that they felt they needed to build a new boat for Hawaii. They brought in, I'll tell you some stories probably else, brought in consultants because of the size of the boats that were going to go over the water. They were what we call blue water. And uh, they said, if you're going to build one boat, why not build two? They're only a half billion dollars each. And 9-11 came along, and nobody, and I mean nobody, was flying to a water. And we had this debt of two large ships at a billion dollars. And this little company could not support uh, that debt, so it went into bankruptcy in 2001. Uh, it was in bankruptcy for about six months, and was the first cruise line ever to come out of a bankruptcy. The court approved us. Uh, our reorganization plan we came out with the Delta Queen and the Mississippi Queen in May. 2002, and we were sold or purchased at auction from the bankruptcy court by a company out of Buffalo, New York, by the name of Delaware North Company. Very large in the hospitality business, uh, have airport food services, have a number of the stadiums. They have a stadium in, in St. Louis, which is uh, my home, uh, and they are geniuses at selling hot dogs. <laughs> and, uh, and they run a lot of fine, fine uh, operations, including uh, some of the national parks. They have some of the concessions in the national parks. They have some of the hotels in the national parks. And so they got into the steamboat business. Uh, personally, I feel they had some difficulty with the marketing that you have to do to, to build these boats. And then we had another catastrophe called Katrina. And prior to Katrina, uh, our number one turnover port in the States was New Orleans. We did over 90 turnovers a year in the city of New Orleans. Because of the weather, we don't go past Memphis up until late May or early June. So, if you're operating out of New Orleans as your home base, and you can't go to New Orleans, uh, you have to basically shut the boats down. They did uh, charter uh, this boat out to an oil company for a while. Uh, but they had just, I, I, I think, uh, got to the point uh, that they were ready for someone to come in that would appreciate the boats and take them to the next step. And Majestic America Lines came in. Majestic America is a company that's a subsidiary of Ambassadors International. Uh, our 
Chairman Emeritus is uh, Mr. Uberall, uh, uh, Commissioner of Baseball, Peter Uberall, if you're a baseball fan, ran the uh, Olympics uh, in Los Angeles, very successful businessman, uh, has been very successful in the hospitality business. Uh, his son, Joe, is president of the company. And uh, Joe Uberoff and a young man, I say young, great to be, uh, by the name of David Gearsdorf, whose dad had started America West Steamboat Company. And they got together and they felt that they could do something in cruise ships in the United States. So in January uh, of 2006, they purchased America West Steamboat Company. And then in April of 2006, they purchased uh, from Delaware North the vessels of the Delta Queen Steamboat Company. And we could not have been adopted by nicer parents. They understand the business. Mr. Beersdorf grew up literally on his dad's boats and has been in the business all of his life and he's had a very successful career in marketing on his own so he understands the business. So we're just delighted to be part of the Jesuit. They want to leave the beer small boat cruise line in the United States and I think they're off to, off to a good start. Uh, I will tell you that this boat, because I want to point out some of the antiques and some of the furniture as we're doing the tour, will only be on this deck. And since we have such a large crowd, we won't be able to go uh, into all of the areas and let me point out the things in the areas while we're, while we're there. So I'm going to tell you about some things to look at in some of the areas that we're not going to go, go to. We're going to stay on this deck. We're going to go all the way to the other end of the boat. And you see that large silver urn that's in the port that you've been passing as you've been getting on and off the boat. And you thought it was the world's largest coffee pot? It's not. I'm going to tell you what it is. So if you can go down either side, uh, we're going to go all the way to the other end of the boat. I'm going to talk about that urn. I'm going to tell you about some things to look at in the ladies' parlor, the gentlemen's card room. We'll go into the Mark Twain Gallery. I want to give you some more history of the fabulous Delta Queen. It has such a history and has been part of our nation's history. But I want to tell you some more about that boat. And I promise you that we will end the tour by 12 o'clock so you won't miss lunch. <laughs> Well, the, the, no, uh, they, they are not part of it now. The independence was dragged out of service in 2006. Because it was both that was 30 years old, it's no longer had solace regulations. So the two Norwegian boats that are sailing in Hawaii now right, are boats that were about 50% constructed when we went into bankruptcy and they bought the boats and had the, they the only two boats that they have that are American. Did it still the same boats? Yes, same design. We had already designed them. They were halfway built. Didn't one on the East Coast not from another East Coast? Different That's a different line. Uh, this is our four-year area. Very typical of what you would have seen in the 1850s when you joined your riverboat cruise. This is, uh, let me turn, it'll start squeaking if I turn it up too loud, but we'll see if we get a little more power. If y'all want to, you can move in just a little bit. We're all family by now. But very typical of what you would have seen if you had come on to cruise in the 1850s. But when the designers did this in the 1990s, they wanted to give you a few features that you would not have had in the 1850s. You would have not had the electric lights. 
uh, you would have not had hot and cold running water in your cabin, and you would have had a chamber pot next to your bed. So you can just get carried away with that authenticity thing. The urn that you see here is a reproduction. It was done for us by Reed and Barton Silversmiths. I tried to have it replated a few years ago. It's so large, nobody makes a bat large enough to replate it. So we just have to keep polishing the heck out of it. And this was your potable water supply when you were on the old steamboat. Where you see the knob on the side, there would have been a chain. At the end of the chain would have been a tin cup. If you were thirsty, you would go by and you would get your drink of water. The table that is here came off of an old steamboat called the New Republic. Again, being very practical in the 1850s, you'll see that the edges on the marble is grooved. And so if you spilled your water on the table, it wouldn't run off on the floor. I'll tell you another little story if you promise not to tell anybody. During one of our layup periods, the urn was off, the table got tipped, and the marble was cracked. And I went to a marble company in New Orleans and said, I want a brown marble to match the marble that's on the table. I want to have it grooved, and I want the top replaced. What are you going to charge me? And they said $15,000. Oh. So you'll see a very fine <laughs> crack running right through here where we repaired the table. And nobody will know except me and you if you don't tell them. I want to tell you about the ladies' parlor. There's so many of us. We won't go in there, but I want to give you some of the history of it. And you can go back later and investigate. The finest piece of furniture in there is the old pump organ. It's called a melodeon. It's 156 years old. The room was designed around the mantelpiece. The mantelpiece came from an old plantation home that was being torn down in St. Francisville, Louisiana, where we were a few days ago. Uh, the designers felt it was such a beautiful piece that they designed the room around the mantelpiece. The blue sofa in there is a reproduction and it's called a swooning couch. And that's in case the ladies got the vapors. <laughs> now the ladies laugh because they know what I am talking about. The men are just staring into space because what's the vapors? Well, you get the vapors if your corset is too tight. And I haven't had a lot of people use the swooning couch because I don't guess ladies wear the corsets that they used to wear in, in those old days. There's a very small desk in there, a ladies writing desk. It's also an antique. About 50% of the furniture you see in the public spaces is antique. The balance of it is reproductions of the time period. In the gentleman's card room, uh, the fish that is over the, I call it the eagle sofa, that's called a tarpon. That fish was caught off the coast of Galveston in 1895. Uh, we also have the bear in there. Uh, the bear is over 100 years old. It's not politically correct today to go out and shoot bears and, and we didn't have anybody do that, but uh, the bear is an antique, and the pictures that you see around the area where the bear is are pictures uh, depicting Teddy Roosevelt, and when he refused to shoot the baby bear that was tied up, and the teddy bear got its name. Uh, of the lamps that you see around the boat, uh, they are mostly reproductions. Uh, two of the larger lamps, and I think I've got one of the larger lamps off, off for repair. There are two actual Tiffany lamps on board, but the remainder of the lamps are Tiffany lamps. But they are Melinda Tiffany, and Melinda is a niece, or grandniece, I guess now, or great-grandniece uh, of the original Tiffany family. Uh, she has been in the business her entire life, and uh, so 
They are Tiffany lamps, but they are not the original Tiffany Company lamps. The wallpaper that you see in the gentleman's card room that you see in the J.M. White dining room. If you're from California, you might recognize the name Bradbury and Bradbury. Uh, it is all hand printed. Uh, we'll average about $55 a running foot for uh, wallpaper because we've had to replace some of it and I can tell you from experience. Uh, and this paper has been here since the boat came out. So uh, the designers uh, did a gorgeous job in finding papers. They have been making these papers in the Bradbury Company uh, since the 1800s. They still have their old prints. And it is all hand printed. If you ever get the chance, it's right out of Sacramento, California. If you're ever out in that area and get a chance to go to the Bradbury factory, they do tours of the factory and show you how the paper is hand printed. Uh, I've also seen uh, a story about the Bradbury family on the A&E network. So if you ever are flipping channels and they're talking about Bradbury and Bradbury paper, you have seen it up close and personal. This is also a Bradbury paper that's here in the foyer. What we're going to do now is we're going to go into the Mark Twain Gallery. I'm going to stand in front of that model of the Delta Queen, point out some of the antiques there, and talk about the grand history of the Delta Queen. Uh, the finest antique we have in here is the piano. It is an upright Steinway, and it dates back to 1868. And if you play the piano, uh, it is a working piano. There are two display cases. The one on my left I especially want to point out because it has a picture of Mary Becker Green in there. It also has a copy of her pilot's license. And if you read that license carefully, it says something to the effect that this is to certify that they've written in Mary B. Green. He is licensed. She was one of the first, and they weren't going to reprint the farm for her. But there is a picture of Mary in there, and for it, there's also a picture of the J.M. White, the Grand Hall of the J.M. White. You will see where our designers got the inspiration for our J.M. White dining room. They wanted to take the best of the boats that we had, the Mississippi Queen and the Delta Queen at the time, and and the best from some of the old steamboats of our history. So they took some elements of the JM White. The staircase that goes down to the dining room is very reminiscent of the grand staircase that goes from the uh, cabin deck up to the Texas lounge on the Delta Queen. So we took many fine items from other boats. Uh, you'll see an Olympic torch in there, and that's relatively new. When they had the Olympics in Atlanta, the last Summer Olympics, I believe, that they had in the United States, they wanted to carry the torch on different forms of transportation. So it went by car, airplane, train, and one steamboat. And they carried the torch on the American Queen. And so they gave us that replica of the Olympic torch as a souvenir of that cruise. Uh, the rack that you see here is not for this really crew or passengers that you see the little hanging things on the side. Uh, that uh, rack came out of an old library and they would hang the newspaper on the wooden spindles that come down and the spindles were used to separate the pages of the newspapers. Now that we have uh, uh, CNN and the cabins and all of these channels uh, were not quite as reliant on newspapers as we uh, used to be. Every time we'd stop at a port, we'd run out and grab some newspapers. We still do, but we don't get as many as we used to. The other display case is all dedicated to showboats. Showboats are rich in river history, but the only showboat that was ever a steamboat was on the MGM lot in California when they filmed the movie. They were barges, and they were pushed up and down the river. They were showrooms that were built on a barge. Many times the captain of the towboat would own the boat, but uh, they were truly not steamboats. 
but they have a rich history very closely tied uh, to what people envision uh, a uh, steamboat of that era to be, mostly because of the movie Showboat. This is the Delta Queen. Uh, the Delta Queen was built in Stockton, California. It started in 1926 and came out in 1927. It was a twin boat. Two boats built at the same time to the same exact specification. The keel was made in Scotland, taken apart, brought to the United States, and all of the rest of the boat was constructed out of wood in Stockton, California. The boats ran between Sacramento, California, and San Francisco. They would leave at 6 o'clock in the evening from the opposite port, pass in the night, the next morning you would wake up in the opposite city. They operated on that route up until World War II. World War II came along, both boats were drafted. They went into the service of the Navy. The Delta King was set up as officers' quarters in the bay, and the Delta Queen was used to ferry the young men uh, from the various ports, wharfs, out to the big ships that were coming into the bay. After the war, the Delta Queen, or it was called, it wasn't called the Delta Queen, but presented new challenges. Helping to coordinate this gigantic effort was Linda Landisburg. The design team did about two years worth of research and investigated all of the older steamboats, the great ladies of the of the rivers from the 1800s, of course the J.M. White with all its magnificent furnishings and interiors, and for the exterior, the Grand Republic was the main model. Uh, we also took a lot of information from the Mississippi Queen and the Delta Queen, which of course are our, two of our favorite steamboats, and we incorporated our favorite things and what our passengers' favorite things were about those vessels. And we had a gentleman named Stuart Gordon out of Los Angeles that actually traveled all over the country and would send us photographs every week of all the antiques he found, and we'd apply them to different spaces as we had the rooms planned and laid out. Back at the shipyard in Morgan City, the American Queen soon outgrew the construction shed that was her nativity. In early July 1994, she was placed on grease skids and slowly, carefully, brought out to meet the world. To those eager to stand back and view her in her entirety, her slow crawl seemed to take an eternity. In fact, it took two days. We like to think it's wanting to go to, towards the water into its natural state. Uh, any vessel this size up on the land is a bit of an unnatural uh, surrounding for it. A month later, her dry dock was carefully, slowly submerged, and her hull deemed watertight. She had passed her first test and rested gracefully in her element. She's all you. Her massive 50-ton, 30-foot-wide paddle wheel was fabricated in the construction shed where she had been born and was laboriously positioned and gently lured into place in her stern. On August 22, 1994, dignitaries once more gathered at Morgan City to celebrate another milestone in the life of America's newest steamboat. It was the American Queen's blessing, and once more, former Congresswoman Lindy Boggs would be on hand to mark the occasion. Now, integral to any self-respecting steamboat is her calliope. The Delta Queen Steamboat Company turned to Dave Moorcraft in Peru, Indiana, who fabricated and installed the American Queen's beautiful set of 37 shining gold-plated whistles and the keyboard on which they're played. She was almost ready. But even though her vintage engines passed numerous tests while tethered at a wet berth, the great lady had yet to begin her first tender steps to test the waters of an open river under her own power. On March 12, 1995, at sunup, she crept from her berth and nosed cautiously out to the open waters. Safely out of the busy shipping channel, her vintage steam engines were engaged, and for the first time, her huge paddle wheel began its design task of propelling the American Queen. I think she's going to be a charmer. Uh, she's going to be a nice boat. Uh, she's going to be different. She'll look different than anything we have. 
and she is going to look like an old-time riverboat, really. Her wheels are turning, her diesels are turning, and she's the biggest boat ever designed for the Inland Waterways of the United States. Um, up over 100 feet tall on the stacks, 420 feet long, 90 feet wide. Amazing vessel, and this is her first day out on the water. The sea trials proved the American Queen's capabilities, but they also proved much more. For the first time, the visionaries at the Delta Queen Steamboat Company were assured that their bold undertaking would be a success. They had built an authentic steamboat, and it worked. May 4th, 1995. This was an exciting day for those who love steamboats and relish in the romance of the river. For many people at the Delta Queen Steamboat Company, it was the culmination of three years of anticipation. The American Queen appeared through the glimmering haze. Dave Moorcraft proudly playing the calliope he had assembled en route. Hearts beat faster, and heads craned to catch what for many was their first glimpse of America's newest paddle wheeler. Jazz bands heralded her arrival. Her masters, Captains Lawrence Keaton and John Davitt, formally presented her to the people of the Delta Queen Steamboat Company and the city of New Orleans, who so eagerly awaited her. Right now, on behalf of Captain Davitt and the crew of the American Queen, I would like to present the American Queen to the Delta Queen Steamboat Company, the employees, and their families, and the city of New Orleans. Thank you. With the American Queen's triumphant arrival in New Orleans, many years of aspirations and planning, and almost two of construction, were now nearing their culmination. The results of a nationwide scavenger hunt were now coming home and each piece had a special location. Sometimes the, the rooms did it for us, sometimes the pieces that we found helped us decide what to actually do with the room. It's June 2nd, 1995, and an enthusiastic crowd of steamboat aficionados had gathered in New Orleans for the christening of the new steamboat. Angel Harvey, wife of ABC radio commentator Paul Harvey, both veteran steamboaters, snipped the line that sent the world's largest bottle of premium Tabasco brand pepper sauce crashing into the bow of the American Queen. I christen thee the American Queen. God bless the American Queen and all who sail upon her. this was a distinctly proud American moment. She's spectacular. I can't wait to show her off to America. That's what I'm really looking forward to. She set sail the next day on the first of several short shakedown trips that progressively took her upriver to Pittsburgh, the starting port of her inaugural cruise. She was greeted with enthusiasm at each new port she visited. And here she comes. If you're anywhere within the sound of my voice and you want to see the most beautiful riverboat ever built, if you want to see history come to life right here in Natchez, Mississippi, then you need to come on down. Bands played, moms and dads, grandmothers and grandpops, big kids and little kids, they all teamed down to the levee to welcome the river's new monarch. Sometimes they'd turn out by the thousands, each with a special place in their hearts for this very American lady. On Saturday, June 17th, she tied up for the night, a routine steamboat and practice called choking a stump. Little did her crew realize the rate at which the level of the Ohio River was dropping. For the next three and a half days, her unplanned beach party was the focus of the country and certainly great entertainment to the people of Troy, Indiana, across the river from where she was stuck. But there's something about Steamboat that stirs the soul. Folks rushed to the riverbank in mobs to cheer her on when, free at last, she continued eastward towards a Pittsburgh inauguration. All along her route, folks again streamed down to the river to cheer the Queen on. 
On June 27th, her tribulations behind her, the American Queen proudly underwent her inaugural ceremony, signaling the start of her 16-night inaugural cruise, a journey that retraced the steps of the first significant steamboat voyage, the 1811 cruise of the steamboat New Orleans. As history often does, it repeats itself in this feat. For helping inaugurate the nation's newest steamboat was a great, great-granddaughter of Nicholas Roosevelt master of the gallant New Orleans. And aboard this historic trip was another Nicholas Roosevelt, the captain's great-great-grandson and namesake, along with his wife Lydia. Midway through the 16-night odyssey, beneath the famous St. Louis Arch, the American Queen joined her sisters, the legendary Delta Queen and the magnificent Mississippi Queen in an historic first gathering. Each passenger on the American Queen's inaugural season cruises felt the historic significance of their participation. They too are part of the fabric of America's rich historic tapestry. The names of every passenger on this first inaugural cruise will be permanently engraved on the American Queen's bell. With every peal of that bell as the American Queen travels the rivers in the years to come, their names will ring out as very important persons in the history of Steamboat. The American Queen is the grandest steamboat that has ever been built. She is virtually a 20th century time machine that takes people back to the 1900s and relives the full grandeur of Mark Twain's Mississippi River. When her passengers stepped aboard for that history-making 16-night journey to New Orleans, her opulence and beauty more than surpassed their already high expectations. Beautiful, like in our room. Oh, I mean, it's amazing strange. how they could collect so many uh, antiques, and they are beautiful. And it does make it uh, uh, sort of like you see in movie pictures of the old southern uh, mansions. We're lucky to have one of those rooms that have a veranda on the outside, so we can sit there and watch the so country go by. And I, we spend a lot of time there. It's, it's really what I like about. River boating or that sort of thing. My husband is a history buff, so the historical aspect of this whole trip has been particular interest to us. As I go around through different areas of books, I'm picking up just unique things that I've never seen before. Each place aboard the American Queen is special. Each room an experience. Her dining room was inspired by the graceful main cabin aboard the J.M. White. Once more, the 20th century meets the 19th. From a shiny modern galley to an elegant steamboat gothic dining room comes an endless array of mouth-watering temptation. The American Queen features intimate lounges where following Victorian and steamboat etiquette, ladies once would retire to the parlor to sip tea. Gentlemen would repair across the vestibule to their own card room, smoke cigars, and engage in a few hands of poker. In an opulent salute to those floating theaters, the showboats of their day, there's a two-story grand saloon that's reminiscent of a small river town's opera house. Its private box seats and sweeping balcony offer enviable views of lavish entertainment, and authentic Victorian details abound, inspiring one steamboater to declare she felt like she was inside a Fabergé Easter egg. There are places to catch up on a good book or just relax. Places like the front porch of America, where guests can settle down with a coffee and watch the ever-changing River Vista glide by. Or to learn more about Old Man River, they can visit the chart room and follow their journey on actual river charts. And there's the rollicking engine room bar, a night spot which designers intimate was actually constructed by the boat's engineers who removed some staterooms late one night in order to have a saloon that was easily accessible to their engine room directly below. It's a nice story and adds to the romanticism of this great lady. You can even head down the stairs, visit the engineers, and watch those old steam engines at work. Of course, the American Queen has modern amenities like elevators, a bathing pool, and athletic club a well-stocked gift shop called the Emporium, individual climate control in each exquisitely furnished stateroom, and even a beauty salon. Yet her roots are firmly anchored in Steamboat's golden age. 
Yes, each room tells a story. But together, they're the story of the men and women who dare to dream. Maybe for them, there's a special place in the boat where all their dreams seem to come home. It's a gallery, appropriately named for Mark Twain, which houses a collection of riverboat artifacts and a 600-volume library of vintage reading material, including many works by Mr. Twain, whose chronicles of river life, even when disguised as fiction, vividly recreate the glories of steamboating and life on the Mississippi. So now the grand American queen has established her presence in America's rivers, steaming not only into the many historic, charming towns and cities that line their banks, but also into the hearts of the people of these communities, and into those of the passengers who traverse her elegant rooms and relax on her spacious decks. These special, stalwart, and hardy people who answer the river's call, who go where it takes them, who proudly call themselves steamboaters. It is for people like these who come back again and again to relive the legend of steamboating that the folks at a relatively small but enthusiastic American company of dreamers and doers work so tenaciously to see generations of dreams come true.